Hello, everyone. So good to see you all. Um, okay. I'm just going to wait a little bit. Um, okay, one second. Okay, um, we can get started. Um, I know I, I, am, I am so pleased to see all of you. It's hard to concentrate with everything that's going on. Hi, Joy. With everything that's going on, you know, first, you know, for a long time, it's still ongoing with the pandemic. Black Lives Matter. And then yesterday, the terrible news about status of international students. So it's hard to concentrate. Uh, sorry. Um, but, you know, um, as a faculty and uh, director of the academic program, one of my goals is to make sure that all of you, you know, flourish. So we'll try to concentrate. And uh, I want to thank Lila, who's the um, director of events at GSOP. So she's going to coordinate and moderate. If you have questions anytime during the day, just use the chat box and you know, send in or for sure to make time for uh, Q&As. So what we will do today is probably I'll speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. And I also want to acknowledge we have a number of faculty here. Maura is here. Uh, Marlo is here. I may not be seeing everybody. Um, so just holler if you are in uh, any of the faculty. And uh, so my goal is to give an outline of the process as well as to, you know, really kind of spell out our expectations. And then I will uh, ask Joy, who is um, our proud graduate of 2020 and uh, also a proud winner, um, you know, award winner. And uh, she'll also, she'll, she'll um, outline how she approached the process and could share his ex her experience with you uh, in 10 to 15 minutes, you know, uh, hold your questions a little bit. And then we'll have Alana. Uh, Alana, if you're there, you can wave your hands. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows you. Uh, and the same with Joy. Alana is also our proud graduate of uh, 2020, also award winner uh, for, from UP. And then she was among one of the few students who took up the capstone option the very first time. So she'll share her experience on um, working on a capstone and again in a 10 to 15 minutes and then hold your questions a little bit and we'll then open up for Q and A's. And this session is also taped, so if it's, that's okay with you and you know, if you don't feel comfortable with your questions, feel free to shoot us a private question or you know, email me later. So um, with that, I will, we'll get started. And I'm going to share a screen. I will also make my PPT available to everyone afterwards. And um, so let's share the screen. Okay, can you all see well? Alana, give me a thumb up. Great, thank you. Um, so 
Uh, for many years, we only had a thesis. We didn't have any uh, capstone. So I'll go with the thesis a little bit. Um, so what is a thesis? We are defining thesis somewhat in a more traditional way. And that's also why we have a, now an option for doing capstone. So thesis in social sciences tends to refer to how we can structure, you know, and organize and make a compelling and logical case for either an idea. For example, that would be an idea of digital technology is a form of infrastructure. It's not quite a theory. So the next is for theory. And theory is more abstract and uh, also, you know, can be replicated in different places. So we know markets are represented by imperfect competition. That's a theory. And some of us may be quite ambitious to take on a theory to maybe extend that. And you can write a thesis about that. Or you try to construct an argument uh, or case for a testable hypothesis. And, um, and this, for our next session on thesis, I will talk about research design. I will look at how a number of teams have done in the past to show how density may cause harmful effect on, on health, right? And hold your questions. There's lots of questions about that. I know that. Or you're trying to make a case for a policy position. You know, many of you know about community boards in New York City, and you can argue and then provide evidence and make a case for that community boards are an effective platform for public engagement in the planning process, right? Last but not least, and many of our thesis writers focus on making a case for some empirical finding. Okay, so for example, uh, you want to show the changing levels of vulnerability of low income population in New York City over time, either overall or to various different um, risks and exposures, right? So, so think about thesis of making a case and gathering evidence and trying to prove that case on any one of these kinds of so gathering and analyze evidence in a systematic way is really important for thesis. So here it is. So when you look at any of those five examples I just gave you, you are making a proposition. You are essentially trying to um, defend that proposition. And in order for you to collect evidence on that proposition, we have to say it's really more about the past, not about the future. So thesis very rarely or ever is focusing on the future. So uh, one of our faculty colleagues used to say, there is no crystal ball. So thesis is not about projecting the future, generally. So a couple years ago, we went through a lot of approval to get this option started. Oops. That is, many of our students want to focus more on practical matters. And so that is a professional capstone, right? So you want to apply your knowledge and skills to address an important or important planning issues. And in that process, you show your understanding of the issues. You also show what constraints there are for you to try to resolve that issues. Nonetheless, you are proposing some potential solution. And so in some way, it has a little bit of a future in it. And I will, you know, it's not that sort of black and white, right? But here we really want you to focus on an applied real world project for an actual client. And Alana will help you understand how that works out and I'll be happy to answer questions. So when we uh, conceived the professional capstone, we also wanted to give students flexibility. That is, um, you can work on all different kinds of real world projects, right? So here are just some examples, a, you know, a traditional urban design project uh, or a traditional planning project uh, or uh, working for advocacy or government agency on a client report that can be both policy or physical, physically or plan oriented or in a research analysis. 
uh, or even a GIS model or even an app. So we want our students to explore these possibilities. So these are, um, you know, potential outcomes we had foresee and maybe we hadn't foresee everything. So some of our students could also produce something beyond this list. So work with us, work with your advisor, right? Um, so if we think about a thesis or capstone, it's about a product that you want to be proud of and you want to be conveying to others. So these others is your audience. Who's your audience, right? So generally, you could the thesis could be to the large profession of planning. So that's on the top. And then or to a specific client um, or a community recipient, again, on the top, the two general categories of audience. And then on the left, you see, quote unquote, mode of reasoning. That is how you actually uh, go about uh, delivering the thesis outcome or the capstone. Either is imaginative, meaning quite sort of creative, uh, thinking of future, thinking of something may not, that may not be quite there yet, that you are paving the way to get there, or propositional. So I talked about propositional, right? So if you do this two by two table, the first you will get an imaginative kind of um, theoretical or conceptual or types of um, writing that point to us to new directions of thinking. Say, you know, with pandemic, with COVID-19, how we may reimagine public space. Um, but you kind of do it in a more um, conceptual way, less practical, but you also are not drawing uh, real evidence or real um, past experience to convince people that this or that idea in your essay will work. So that's an essay. And then you are being very imaginative, speculative about um, the need of a particular community uh, to um, kind of redesign, reimagine their public space. So one of the studio groups worked on that, right? That's more like a design, a plan. And again, I don't want to put all of this you know, squarely in each box and they don't really bleed through. They always bleed through. But by na very nature, uh, a design is more imaginative and it is less propositional. And then there's thesis, right? Thesis is propositional. It is trying to speak to the larger profession or the informed public. That is to say your thesis should be situated in the field and connected with other people's work on a similar or same topic. And then when you finish your thesis, your work can inform others in the profession, right? Um, and professional capstone falls more in the propositional, but more specifically to the needs of uh, a client or a community. Um, so I, why don't I put capstone in the design box? You could, if your uh, capstone project is very much of a design project, but our requirement for the capstone is beyond just a design. We would like you, and I think Alana could also tell you more, that we would like you to also review some literature, some writing about the issue that you work on in capstone. So it's not a pure design without some research process with some uh, propositional thinking, okay? So I know there will be lots of questions and I'll ha I'm happy to answer later. So um, I'm going through things really quick. Um, basically, oh yeah, let me stop here. So right now you're just at the very starting point and and I will spell out a little bit of what to do next between now and August 17th, when we would like to know um, your pre preliminary ideas of a topic, right? But overall, a thesis and capstone is an annual process, takes two semesters. 
the first semester in the fall, um, and it will be very much of a small workshop, no more than 10 people in a group with one advisor. So after we see your form on um, around mid-August, all of the advisors will gather, will try to match between your need and our expertise, and then we'll make sure you will uh, be able to work with the faculty in the fall semester that matches close sufficiently close to your interests, right? And uh, so in the fall is very much of like, almost like studio, but um, more on research, more on conceptual uh, thinking, uh, more on how do we gather data? How do we reach out to people to gather data? So that's, so we'll have weekly breakout workshops. And the last bit of that content, IRB stands for Institutional Review Board, because many of you will be going out, uh, I mean, depending on how things pan out uh, this uh, fall and the winter, how much you can go out is still questionable, but a lot of us are also able to reach out to folks online. So when you do that, you are interacting with human subjects and, and, and there's, um, ethical uh, framework to um, make sure that we're doing the proper thing to respect people's confidentiality, privacy, and so on and so forth. So for now, that's all you kind of need to uh, uh, know about IRB and we'll have training also in the um, fall semester. And so the deliverables for the fall uh, is a proposal be it for your thesis or for your capstone. And then you will also will need a reader, other than your advisor, to help you in the spring semester uh, to finalize your writing, right? So we would like you to uh, identify a reader and get their agreement at the end of fall. And then for those of you who are uh, working on capstone, um, you need a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with your client. And then we have that form and Alana can talk a little bit more and I will have, we'll talk more in the fall in each group. So usually in the past, in between fall and spring, lots and lots of students began doing field research and or data collection because some of the students use secondary data and that's totally cool. And, uh, and you use that time to collect it. So in the spring, it's very much writing on your own, um, meeting either in group or individual fashions as needed. So that's when you make an appointment with your advisor or your advisor decides there are points of time in a spring semester that folks need to meet together. And then basically the, the complete draft is due right after spring break. And then uh, for one week in April, everybody uh, defense their thesis or capstone um, that we call it jury week and then your final version uh, is due into the office May 7th and just before your graduation. Yeah? Um, so between now and August 17 what, what, should, should, what should we all do right so what next immediately? So I would encourage you to think about a topic and you can change that topic by October. The reason is that uh, too far beyond that, you won't have sufficient time to work on a new topic in some depth and then complete your thesis or capstone in time, right? So uh, that's uh, for your um, um, consideration. Uh, so uh, in the form, you are welcome to present more than one topic. You know, the, the job of the fall workshop is about helping you to narrow down and focus, right? So it's fine for right now, you got two or three ideas, that's totally good. And so ideally, your topic should be in sync with your chosen uh, concentration. If you're still wondering about that, that's okay too, right? But by the end of the fall, both the topic and your concentration should be very clear. And then you can choose, um, in any of the function, functional areas of planning, housing, land use, health planning, you know, um, community development, anything. 
And then you want to think about it, whether there is a geographical focus for you, right? Do you want to work on a particular country or you want to work on a uh, planning area that's quite general? And then you want to think about, do you want to use a particular method like machine learning or do you, are, are you open to like mixed methods, right? So just sort of some thought to get you going. You know, try to answer any of these questions will get you go. Um, and then this tough decision, which only started last year, this should I do a thesis? Should I do a capstone? You can switch once by October. That again is just to make sure that you have enough time to actually complete your product. And so here, I think there are a number of considerations for you all to think about, like whether you are more interested in in-depth research or you're more interested in a practical solution, right? And that makes big difference. And then for anybody who's doing either a thesis or a capstone, you wanna think about whether this is a place to demonstrate your expertise and then your product becomes a sample of a work that you can show to anybody, you know, potential employers or anybody else, right? Um, because that's actually quite different from the next consideration. Some students actually want to use thesis as an opportunity to learn a new set of skills. Um, and I have had students do that quite a bit. You know, you've done so much quantitative work, you've never used qualitative methods, you've never used, uh, you know, photojournalism, you want to do a project on that through your thesis or capstone. That's totally cool, right? And if you already know where you want to work, you really want to um, uh, integrate into the mandate of that organiz organization quite immediately, and maybe you want to do work to prepare for that, and that was, would be another consideration. And then some of you are interested uh, in perhaps pursuing a PhD down the road. Uh, and if you, that is your ambition and uh, goal, then maybe you know research and in-depth research in an area that you have been interested in, or in a new area would be uh, called for. So any of these considerations will help you uh, kind of um, get going. So the, the point is get going and just keep thinking and um, jot down your ideas. I can't um, oh, emphasize enough that always write down your ideas, even if you know, they get scratched off down the road. Um, so yeah, that's 20 minutes all, already on my side. So I'll stop and I will introduce Joy. Uh, and um, so she can share her experience with writing her thesis um, over last year, I guess. Should I start? Okay. Cool. Hi guys, um, I'm Joy. I just recently graduated from GSAP. I'm sure some of you know me or have seen me around before COVID happened. I'm always hanging out in the planning lounge. Currently working at Borough Happold. I just started like three weeks ago. Um, so that's been fun. Um, so today I just wanted to kind of walk you through uh, what the thesis process was like for me. I don't want to go in depth of like the contents of my thesis. You can all look that up. It's like public information. So I don't want to take up that time, but basically share some like tips and tricks and also lessons learned um, as I was going through the process. And also, you know, how I saw, um, you know, my friends and peers also going through that process. I would say that absolutely, Wei Ping's completely correct. You should start thinking about your thesis topic now. I was thinking about it around this time too. Um, uh, the end of my first year and it doesn't ha you don't have to like sit down and like kind of like you know take a whole day and think about it but basically you know as you're going about everything as you're reading the news or um, as you're sitting in front of your computer or just browsing Facebook and you see a particular topic it doesn't even have to be planning related um, a topic that is interesting to you and you think oh wait I have some questions about this topic that I would really like to look into further write it down right i have um a bunch of i have like a google doc where i just copy and paste all the articles i find and i see just randomly browsing i just copy paste it down maybe type a few notes like oh this 
uh, have write a question. I write a question, and then eventually that became kind of um, how uh, like a talking point when you start talking in your thesis groups and with your thesis advisor. Um, and definitely like those news articles that you come across now that you don't think um, you know might not even be relevant. Still keep them there. Um, you can use them. Eventually they might even be. Um, really important to you later on, you never know. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that a topic that you think is great now uh, might be completely different a few months down the line. And this has happened to almost everybody in my thesis group. I was in Professor Anthony Venke's group. Um, congratulations to him. He uh, is now taking an assistant position at somewhere else. Um, great professor, great advisor. Um, and uh, basically what happened was everybody started off the semester, the first, their first semester with one topic. And then by the end of uh, the first half, the first semester, everybody was freaked out and trying to wonder what should we do? And some people, their, the, their final thesis and what they proposed were completely different topics. And that's okay, but you have to keep in mind that um, the folks that happened to do that did struggle a little bit with timing in the second half because they had to, you know, completely redo their data collection. They had to completely rethink like their literature um, and how to go about their research. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen and kind of, let's see. Um, okay. I really don't want to see this. Um, all right, so my thesis was about um, fracking and uh, the intersection of fracking and planning. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much, but the basic gist of it was that um, I got interested in an article I read about Colorado um, putting a new initiative on their ballot that would be effectively create like a 2,500 foot zone buffer um, from any residential area to um, from fracking. So you cannot frack or dig any new wells within 2,500 feet of um, a residential place. Um, and it wasn't just Colorado, like a lot of states were considering it, especially a lot of uh, states that had heavy fracking. Um, and what fracking is, is just you're trying to get like shale oil and natural gas by digging deep in the ground and putting a lot of chemicals in it. Um, and basically, you know, that got me thinking, wait, I've never thought about this before. Um, this is an interesting topic. Could I apply what I've learned in my classes, um, like uh, using data analysis, machine learning, an amalgamation of different sorts of methods to kind of uh, analyze the situation because it's not really been taught in a planning context. Like I've never heard about this particular problem in my planning class, yet they're using planning terms, uh, zoning, Right. So how would planners, you know, tackle this problem? This is not something that's really discussed that much. So can I find the intersection of planning and this energy, this field of what's traditionally been like engineering energy and a lot of politics, right? Fracking is very political. Um, it also touches on environmental issues, issues of social justice. Where are you fracking? Um, these are all things that I am very was very interested in, still very interested in. Um, you know, who are whose backyards are you fracking in? Is it low income people's um, backyards? Are they predominantly clustered in certain areas? Um, so, so basically, you know, this was a a deck I made for the thesis defense. You don't have to make a deck, but it's a lot easier if you do. Um, talking about the history and background and basically the first step I did to look into it was okay what data can I get right what data is out there publicly available can I even think about this question do I even have the resources to answer the questions that I have and the first thing I do was go online and just search like what publicly available data do I have go on all the government agencies you think might be relevant so for me it was you know the US Geological Survey US um, Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, and then just go into states and, um, you know, where does fracking happen most? Texas. Okay, I go to Texas. Do they have a GIS database I can use of all their fracked wells? It turns out that there was a publicly available kind of a database of fracked wells, um, like registered fracked wells. So my data is actually missing some more privately owned wells or not registered wells, um, but that's okay because I already have a lot of data here. 
um, map them out, see if I can find any initial relationship. And um, I know Wei Ping said you can start thinking about your data collection maybe in between your proposal and you know when you start writing, but I would actually suggest that you start thinking about it now. Um, because that is probably the key driver of how successful your thesis will be. Do you have the data? You can have a great question, but if you have no data to back it up or no resources to back it up, like um, if you're thinking about interviewing people as your main point of data collection, you need to start email thinking, or at least make like a contact list of people you want to reach out to or you think should, would be good to reach out to and actually start drafting emails and you know asking them. It doesn't matter if you don't end up actually interviewing them or if you don't actually end up talking to them. It's useful to establish that initial point of contact because people are slow. And now, you know, during COVID, they're even less likely to want to, you know, pick up the phone and talk to people. Um, everybody's just sitting at home. So, you know, email them now, explain that you are a researcher at Columbia, you know, you're a student, you're a graduate student, and you're doing research, and people tend to want to help out people who are doing research. Um, and kind of explain your ideas and see, you know, in the future, is it possible if I can reach out to you, establish a good connection so that when you need information, it's readily available to you now. Don't wait until last minute, like, just don't, don't do it. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to go through the entire thing. I can show you some slides of my findings, which is really mapping out, um, you know, where fracking happens in Pennsylvania, Texas, and what would happen if we instituted kind of like a graduated set of buffers. Um, as you can see here that, um, you know, this is only a small part. The second part of my thesis was really trying to use um, logistic regressions and doing a lot of statistical analysis on what the reduction of, you know, GDP, labor, employment would be if those uh, buffers were to in be enforced. Well, are the lobbyists correct in saying, oh, if you impose a 2,500 foot buffer, we would effectively lose all of our business. And then, you know, the Department of Commerce said, oh, if we ban fracking, uh, the economy would collapse, US would fall into financial ruin, employment would skyrocket, energy costs would go high, it would be at the apocalypse. Like, is that true? I want that, that that's basically my question, right? Is that true? Um, and so, you know, you could do a lot of things with just a simple question and you can even hinge it on like one or two pieces of like an article that you read. So mine was that report put out by the Chamber of Commerce, like what happens if we ban fracking? Their conclusion was it would be terrible and I wanted to see if that was true. So that was the crux of my thesis. How we went about it was um, in the fall semester, basically everybody kind of, you know, shared um, what their ideas were um, is very different. Everybody had very different ideas. I wrote down some of mine. Like you can tell like the ones that I had initially is completely different from what I ended up with. And that's perfectly fine. You're going to go through this it's an iterative process. One of the most important things to keep in mind is you don't want to scope creep. So a lot of people, it's not that they don't have any ideas. It's that they have a lot of ideas and they don't know what to pick. And um, a good thesis is not necessarily a huge one. Right. It, it's not about answering as many questions as possible. It's about the nuances of answering maybe one or two specific questions and the implications that you can draw from that. And then for us, what policy recommendations, right, to whom are we talking to? What policy recommendations can we make um, that would advance planning or, you know, public policy or advocacy or whatever you're interested in that field. If you're uh, interested in environmental justice, well, what policy recommendations can you make from the results of your thesis that could help advance this field? And it doesn't have to be sweeping, right? You, it could be a small point as long as it somehow advances um, your field of interest, even just so slightly. Um, so here you can see like, you know, like I said, I just, every time I see um, an interesting article, I put it down. The first one, I think this is about cemeteries and human remains and how like cemeteries are taking up too much space. Like, do we need that much space? Um, very different, right? Just put your ideas out there. It'll help you later. Um, one of the things that um, really helped me uh, was, can I move this bar? No, I cannot. Um, having your study variables. So after you think of a topic, you can narrow it down to one or two, just create a table and kind of list out like, what are you actually testing? You need to test like, even if you're not doing like a statistical 
one, it's it's good to have in mind like what are the variables you're looking at. And when I say variables, I don't necessarily mean it in like a math or statistical term. I'm saying if I am researching this question, what are the factors that are most likely to influence the answer that I am looking for? So, for example, my friend he was looking at um, you know digital uh, plan like digital governance. So the so he didn't do any like statistical modeling, but it's also like we would constantly talk and the question I would ask him is, what are you thinking would affect um, how digital governance is done? And are the, the ones that you're looking at relevant? So at first he was like, oh, I'm going to use, you know, UN metrics for, um, for, for test, for, uh, base it on the UN standards. And I'm like, well, the UN standards is for countries. You're looking at cities. Is that scalable? So now look at the independent. Maybe you can extract from UN, like the UN guidelines of good digital governance for countries and see what is independently applicable to individual cities. And the scale might be very different, right? And also the scope, like governing a country is very different from governing a city. So you have to make that distinction very early on. What are the exact variables you're looking at and are they applicable to the questions that you're asking? Um, so, you know, I listed out a bunch of these. I ended up using maybe like a quarter of whatever I listed out. Um, I have my independent variables, which is just what, what, what are the, if I can operationalize what I'm searching for, what would it be? And you should only really have one or two, or at most three. If you have too many independent variables, that means you're trying to look at too many different things and you're going to go crazy. So, you know, I have independent variables and then the dependent variables are the things that get really interesting. Those are the things that you are going to uh, be like detectives and kind of dig into and see if are those actually relevant or not. You might not actually use them. So for me, you know, I had like a whole bunch of economic, you know, things, GDP, gas prices, oil import, those ended up not being important. Um, I started looking more at, you know, the change indicators, the social demographic indicators, you know, looking at jobs, looking at household income, looking at race, like those are the standard, you know, social demographic indicators we use as planners, but also looked at, you know, stuff specific to my, uh, to this topic, which is, you know, the change in number of oil wells, the distance between oil wells, the distance between residential areas or water wells and oil wells and those things. And as you're going about it, you should also, you know, put in your own thoughts about what you think will happen, uh, but don't let that dictate, like, your process. Because, you know, one of the traps that I almost fell in was, you know, I thought, okay, this is what's going to happen. And when my results didn't necessarily show that, I was like, oh, wait, but am I wrong? And sometimes, no, it's, it's not, it's just your initial hypothesis did not match up with the result, and that's fine. That's what you can say in your thesis, like, this outcome was not as expected, but this is what it is. Um, so once you do the data collection, the actual regression only took me, like all the analysis only took me two weeks. And when I say two weeks, I mean like I just sat down and every day I worked on it for like eight hours. But I didn't like stay up all night. I didn't pull like all nighters for two weeks. I just stayed there, did my analysis, document everything. Um, it, and it, I wasn't doing the write up then. It was just, you know, doing the analysis and then having bits of uh, explanation here and there so that I can then organize it later on. I would say that this is not necessarily the case for everyone. I know my friends struggled with some time management issues and it really depends on how you operationalize your process throughout. Um, I'm, going to guide, I'm going to show you something that will help you guys a lot. This is called Zotero. Um, can I share this? Okay, well. Um, I'm going to share Zotero. Okay. This is called Zotero. Do you guys, can everybody see? Zotero is what I use to organize all of my documents, my literature, my files, and this will save you so much trouble down the road. Basically, you should have a folder of all of the different topics you're looking at for your thesis. So for my thesis, it touches on issues of economic, environmental health, and then just, you know, eclectic topics like oil itself, right? Um, regulatory social policy. I separated them into categories I think will be useful for your literature review, because when you write a literature review, you will be, basic, the best way to do it is to group them thematically, or it could be like through time, right? So if you're doing it chronologically, if you're doing like a, a thesis 
well, that is like an anal case study or analysis over time, then you would group it by eras or some sort of time frames. But having those folders that organizes the research that you're looking at. So if I go into my economic, I have all of the papers that I found online or you know I searched up myself through academic journals, I would download them and I would upload them onto my Zotero. And what this does is I basically have a depository. When I'm writing my literature review, I would just go on Zotero, pick up the article I need, and then just write about it. And it, it, it cuts down your workflow process by like 50%. I, I, I like finished before the thesis deadline. That was how efficient um, I became at figuring out this, um, this system. Um, and it's really easy because it, it's, it installs onto your web browser and so when you actually find an article online you just click the icon on your web browser and it'll just automatically save it onto your Zotero folder um, and I think as students you get free access to this so use it um, and then when you're done you can create I can create um, let's see create a uh, create bibliography from item and then you know I use Chicago style a lot you just click OK, and it's copy and paste it onto your clipboard. You just copy and paste it onto your bibliography. And you don't have to go through the whole thing of writing a, a bibliography, and it just saves you so much time. Um, so that's Zotero. Um, and if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to share. Um, and I guess the last thing that I, the last thing that I could talk about is, you know, the end product, right? Um, how to get from from point A to your final product. And the one thing I would say is really like list out. At one point, I just sat down and manually wrote down my questions. So like I, at one point, I had too many things going on. I had too many questions. I was considering too many variables, not enough data. It was just a mess. This was like sometime in mid-April. I sat down. I had a thesis meeting with my advisor. I was like, oh shit, I have nothing to talk about because I have too many things to talk about and he's going to like yell at me for that. So I sat down, took a pen and paper like manually and manually hand wrote, what are my questions? I drew like a square, like a cross did a matrix and wrote down, okay, these are the social issues I'm looking at. These are the economic issues I'm looking at. These are the spatial issues that I'm looking at. How do they intersect, right? Sometimes it's a lot easier if you're drawing a diagram out on paper to organize your thoughts than you know, staring at your screen and being like, oh my God. So um, after I do that, I also talked with my thesis, uh, my second thesis advisor, Professor Moshe, I'm sure you guys had him for economics. Um, he was super helpful in helping me um, organize, like not keep narrowing down the scope and also figuring out some technical details. So that's, that's generally the dynamic between the two. Like your reader will be there as much as you want them to be there. If you don't talk to them, you don't ask them, they're not gonna know what's going on and they're not going to reach out to you. Your thesis advisor is there to help guide you through the process, use them, have the meetings with them, and they'll help ask you the tough questions to help you guide in a tough direction. Your reader is mostly there for like industry knowledge, so like knowledge in that specific field. If you have technical questions, ask them. Your uh, thesis advisor has, is more of a general, you know, how to write the thesis, how to think about the problem. Um, so use them both. Um, and what Moshe told me was, Joy, you need an executive summary. Right, before you even finish your thesis, finish writing and editing and revising your thesis, you need to write an executive summary, which basically allows you, me, to figure out like what is the my whole, you know, a hundred page thesis about? How do I condense it into a two pager? Um, and if you can't do that, that means your thesis is not organized in a way that is easy for people to read. Um, if you can do that, that's great. And it should be in bullet point format. And this really helped me because during your thesis defense, this is exactly what you will be presenting. You'll be presenting something in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so this is helpful and I can talk more about that if you have questions. Um, and besides that, um, that's basically it. Also, if you're doing a, a, like a data thing like I did, it's, it's good to have an Excel file with all your tables. I don't do LaTeX, that takes too long, and frankly, I don't know how to. You could do anything you want in Excel, basically. I made all these tables in Excel. Um, it's also the best way to just have all of your tables um, in one place um, and do your calculations there as well. Um, the data thing I did in R, and then you know, but most of the tables I made in Excel, um, and then they just look nice to format them well. Um, so yeah, that's it for me, a uh, list of equations. When you, uh, I guess the last thing I want to say, uh, sorry, Alana, 
is that um, when you're doing logistical equations to make sure that you have like one document that's separate from you writing your thesis, where you list out all of the equations you're looking at um, with the necessary tables and the variables, and then you could just give it to your reader before your thesis presentation, and it'll make everything a lot clearer, um, and then you don't have to spend all that time uh, reading and revising. Um, I passed the thesis uh, defense with no revisions required, but that's not because I had like a perfect thesis. That's because I did a lot of revisions and talked to my reader beforehand. So basically all their issues and concerns were addressed before I even had the defense. Um, and that's something that you guys should do if you're very data heavy. Um, so yep, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Joy. Um, do you still need to leave at 12? Uh, I think I can stay. I think I can stay. Okay, so then we'll leave the Q&As yeah. towards the end. Yeah, so Alana? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, hope everyone is doing well. Um, oh, my phone, which has my talking points on it. That's my noise. Um, yeah, hope everyone's doing well. Um, so yeah, as Wei Ping mentioned, the capstone process was brand new um, when I started. Um, and I spent the summer similarly to Joy kind of jotting down ideas for a thesis or a capstone, was not sure what I wanted to do. I entered planning wanting to study um, and produce some sort of product about kind of planning in the arts and culture space. Um, so I spent a lot of time speaking with Doug Woodward. Uh, if you guys don't know him, he is the professor who does the joint studio, um, also zoning, and he actually works for Lincoln Center. Um, his full-time job is the kind of head of real estate development there, um, which means that he does kind of the development and modernization of the Lincoln Center campus. So anyway, I had a conversation with him, um, kind of just talking about thesis and capstone, and he was basically presented me with the, the idea for my capstone, um, which uh, was called uh, Creating a Cultural Innovation District at Lincoln Center. Um, and basically his team was working on a project uh, to create a cultural district in the area that sort of connected Lincoln Center, um, which exists, um, actually I have a, I'll just share my screen so you can have some sort of visual with that. Um, it's not working. Let's see. Yeah, it doesn't look like I can share my screen for some reason. Um, You're a co-host, Alana, so there shouldn't be any reason. Yeah, sorry, just clicking on it and it's not, it's not popping. The usual uh, ability to share isn't working for some reason. It's not a big deal. I can just speak to it. Um, it might be my my version of Zoom or something like that. Is that's causing the error? Yeah. Um, if you want to, I don't know if you want to email me your presentation quickly. I can just bring it up on my computer. If you want to talk through, like, send it to me and then start talking, and I'll just get it. When yeah, I'm yeah, talking. sure. Yeah, it's it's not a full presentation. It was just a couple of of screenshots. Um, but I can I can just speak to it. It's not. Okay. Interesting. Um. So yeah. So anyways, the project is basically about Lincoln Center wants to create a cultural district. Um, they spent the summer kind of doing some research with some other peers of mine who were interning for Doug um, about kind of how to connect Lincoln Center, which is about on like West 66th Street with the theater district below and Hell's Kitchen, which has an abundance. Obviously, the theater district has all of Broadway and a lot of artists used to live in Manhattan. Um, and as maybe you know or don't know, a lot of artists, it's too, too expensive to live in Manhattan now. They've moved to Brooklyn and that's kind of now become a, a hub of, of different arts spaces. Um, and so Lincoln Center had this idea of how do we bring artists back to Manhattan? How do we bring them back from the outer boroughs, um, which are succeeding in a way that Manhattan used to, simply because Manhattan's too expensive to live in. Um, so he kind of brought me onto this project, asked if I wanted to do my capstone about it, and it was that simple. I know some of my peers didn't have kind of that same experience in the sense of uh, they weren't, they had to, they were given a project or they went to a different organization and, and worked with them and they had a specific idea. Um, but I already had this existing relationship with Doug because he was my uh, professor for my studio. Um, so anyway, so kind of it began that way and I immediately say yes because it aligned with my interests. Um, and for the first half of the year, um, kind of as Wei-Ping mentioned, you're focused on your proposal. So I worked closer, I think, with my advisor than I did with my client, uh, who was Lincoln Center. Um, and that experience, I think, is 50-50, um, as in some people kind of 
their client is really hands-on versus a little bit more hands-off in the beginning. Um, but I made sure to kind of regularly work and speak with my client about kind of the direction things were heading in and sort of what was happening there. Um, so I sort of would work with my advisor, kind of build a problem statement, build a research question, and bring it back to my clients, see if that aligned with what they were looking for. Um, and so by the end of the first semester, I had a sort of definitive idea of what I wanted to produce, kind of again, based with the input that my client gave me. Um, and I signed a memoranda of understanding, which Wei Ping had mentioned. Um, and that basically is a, a document that uh, says, All right, this is what I'm gonna do for you exactly, and, and kind of lists bullet points. You sign it, your client signs it, and your advisor signs it. So that there's not like a chance that this turns into like free internship work essentially for them. And you're doing extra work that you weren't, didn't sign on to your student at the same time. I think Doug was great as a client because he's a professor and he knows that. Um, but there might be a situation where you're working for a nonprofit group or an agency that, that wants you to do more um, that you sign, than you signed up for. Um, at the end of the day, this is an academic exercise as well. You're producing something to give to your client that's hopefully really helpful, but you should also treat it as an academic exercise as a way to, to further your own research and your own ideas and your own project. Um, I think, um, oh, and just another note about this kind of beginning, this first semester was selecting a reader. Um, this was really important for the capstone process, uh, who you choose. Um, I chose someone who's also a professor, but is mostly a practitioner. Her name is Maxine Griffith. Um, she is like a experienced planner. Um, she works for Columbia now, but worked for planning in Philadelphia and so on. And she was a great second reader because she gave a lot of insight on how to kind of produce a plan or to produce a report that is useful um, for a client. So I think choosing the reader is really important for the, the capstone, especially in that sense. I would maybe recommend talking to your client. They might have someone, an idea of someone who might be able to do it. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, Columbia has a lot of practitioners that are on staff. So that might be a good, good way to do it. Um, so yeah, moving on to the second semester, um, that was like a big crank out time. Um, during winter break, I spent a lot of time um, become, like developing a more comprehensive research design, scheduling interviews, kind of doing that, that, uh, that push right there. Um, so that second semester from when you start at the end of January through when your penultimate draft is due um, in mid-March, you're getting interviews, you're getting the content, the, the, the meat of, of the report and, and, you're, and you're pushing it out. So my final product um, is, uh, was, a, was about a 70 page report. Um, it was, I designed it and wrote it. Um, I created kind of the graphics for it, um, but I know a lot of other Capstone students created like softwares. Um, they created something like through Tableau or, or like an interactive website or something like that. Um, it just, again, just depends on what your client asks for. Um, since Lincoln Center was already building this report, this was something I, I figured could be, they could just pick and choose kind of whatever information they wanted and needed and they can include in their report, or they could just kind of take out whatever pages literally from the report I produced and, and use it and, and present it if they wanted to. Um, so my report itself was kind of broken down into two parts. The first part was sort of introductory material and the second part was sort of like the findings. Um, an important part of the capstone process at least in my experience, was the creation of recommendations. And this again is like the part of the academic exercise, right? You wanna give something to your client. You wanna say, this is, this is, the first part is all the introduction. This is everything I researched. These are the issues addressed. These are the existing conditions. And your client might know it, but they also probably don't. This is maybe what they'll take away. This is maybe what it will be especially useful for them and they'll use it. But the second part, which is sort of the findings and the recommendations, again, speaks to the academic exercise of it all. You know, I've now developed an expertise, semi-expertise in this, in this study. I've spent all year studying this, and these are my findings. This is what you should do with this information. Um, my advisor was Ryan Devlin. He was really amazing at kind of crafting what a capstone is and what it should be. Um, I think he had experience working at other schools where their primary final product was a capstone. But again, it's, it's the idea of producing recommendations. And recommendations, I think at first I was like, I have no expertise in this at all. Like how, as a student, can I just come up with, like, this is what you should do. Um, but there's a lot of different kind of systems in place. And I would encourage um, looking at the new school, they have um, a, an established capstone process. I looked at a lot of their capstones. There's a lot of other planning programs out there that have established um, 
capstone programs and especially as Columbia is just establishing theirs. I think that was a really, really helpful part of this. Um, but yeah, so um, I think, so an example recommendation. Um, so my question that I crafted that first semester was sort of how can Lincoln Center um, expand existing cultural spaces um, in the area to keep artists in Manhattan, to keep artists close by. Um, and one of my recommendations, I had seven total, was um, to incorporate subsidies into operation models. Um, and that came from interviewing artists, interviewing um, different organizations that had rehearsal space that they offered subsidies for. It was again grounded in sort of this field work that I had done. Um, and also again, re rooted in the original research and the original problem statement, which is it's too expensive to be in Manhattan for artists. There are rehearsal spaces that don't offer subsidies. It's, they can't rehearse anymore in Manhattan. So why would they sort of stay? Um, and yeah, so that's an example of the report. Um, just to speak quickly to client relations. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, you're producing this for the client, um, but they should also know, and you should, you know, you want to make sure they know that this is, again, your, your student, this is an academic exercise, um, and you want it to be useful for them, and you want to be able to leave a situation kind of having a good connection, leaving a good taste in, you know, as a good impression for them, um, because this could be someone that has that connection for your future employment, and that's very much how I treated it. Um, especially with my connection with Doug and, and with Maxine, um, who had a lot of connections kind of in the planning world. Um, and you, so you want to just make sure you set up regular communication. I know a lot of my, my peers were very frustrated because they found it hard to communicate. They didn't hear from their client very often, but it's on you, in my opinion, to kind of continue to reach out, continue to speak with them, really establish that relationship. Um, consider yourself a consultant. Like as a consultant, how would you communicate with a client? Um, and then finally, just want to speak to kind of the challenges, any challenges I faced. Um, so the biggest challenge I faced was kind of the client changing their mind sometimes. Um, and this, even though I had submitted the kind of memorandum of understanding, I kind of had to keep pointing back to it and just say, yeah, so I, I know that you mentioned this, but this is sort of what we established I would do. So maybe how can I adjust sort of within that parameter, how can I adjust it to fit your need? Um, it was challenging at times and sometimes I felt very, like beyond stressed about it and I would go to my advisor and I would, um, you know, just say, I don't know what to do. And he was really great about calming me down just saying, this is an academic exercise. You're not, you're not being paid for this. You're producing something for them. Um, again, at the end of the day, you want to, you want them to be happy with it. Um, yeah, fortunately, my client was very happy with, with the final product. Um, Unfortunately, everything's at a halt right now um, because of COVID. The performing arts are really, really precarious right now, which is something that I addressed kind of at the end. Um, I produced this entire report and then COVID hit um, and it's going to have a ridiculously terrible effect on the arts. Um, theaters aren't going to be up for a really long time and, and, and whatnot. Artists are really struggling to stay in the city more than ever. So it's a, it is a pressing project. I wish I could have addressed it more, um, but I'm hoping that once um, you know, they're able to be up and running, I can provide some, some insight and guidance and I can be part of those discussions to really see how theaters are going to address it. Um, yes, and I'm just looking at my notes to make sure. Yeah, and I think everyone who I know who had a capstone did a capstone project and there was just a handful of us had a positive experience. I know people worked with planning departments, they worked with um, nonprofit groups. Um, just, you can think just, I, my recommendation as far as finding a client um, if there's, I think, but I think that um, there was initially produced like a list of potential organizations that might be interested in it. And one of uh, my peers worked with RPA, our Regional Plan Association, and I was an intern for them as they were discussing, what do we do? Like, how do we give a capstone to a student? So my recommendation would be to think of a question, think of your interest, like why did you enter the planning, this planning program initially? Um, what are some of the ways like courses haven't fulfilled maybe what you wanted to initially um, provide and, and form a question around it form and think about what organizations might benefit from you doing more research into that specific topic and that specific field that you were interested in. Um, and that's sort of how I approached it. But yeah, that's, that's about all I have to say about it. I'm sorry that my share screen didn't work, but I'm happy to answer questions, not just in here, but if you wanted to send me an email, I still have my Columbia email active. I can share my report, my final product with you. Um, uh, I have it online, like as a, a, a PDF, so it's, it's easily accessible if it's not up already on Columbia's page. Um, and I'm happy to answer, to answer any questions you have. So, thanks. Thank you, Alana. Um, 
this is actually really eye-opening because really it was the first time we do capstone. You know, I have advised similar projects before in previous institutions. So uh, in any case, you know, the floor is really open. Um, shoot your questions either by raising your hand um, or just type it in the chat box. Um, I just want to recap really quickly what Alana and Joy have kind of um, shared with you all is that um, you may have an ambitious idea and, you, and a great idea and that may take, I don't know, more than a year of research, right? You get you know, really frustrated because you didn't have enough time or you, and as faculty, we always want to make sure that um, you don't get too bogged down by the time constraints. You know, really you only have four to five months, right? It's not up to because, you know, cutting all the other things out. And so we really want to just make sure the process probably matters more to you. That is, you actually learn how to come up with a question, how to gather information to, you know, defend and make that statement. And so um, it's okay in the end, you have, you'll find, you know, Joy was saying, not a big question or big set of findings, but nuanced and, and you really learn. That's really what we are here to help you do. And then if you have a breakthrough finding, that's all the better, right? But that's the icing on the cake. Okay. Looks like we answered all the questions. <laughs> um. I see a question in the. In yeah, the that's for you, Alana. I think. Um, do you mind just reading it aloud, Alana, so that sure. we can capture it in the audio? Yeah, this question is from Michael. Um, you mentioned briefly that you would be open to continuing to work on the organization after graduation. Is this a real possibility? Do you know of people who continue to work on their capstone projects after graduation? Yeah, um, I think for me, um, that opportunity was there, and due to COVID, um, it was not there anymore. Um, so yeah, I think I would, I would be working on it right now for them if the, 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 the COVID did not hit um, and is having just a, this impact on the arts specifically. Um, I know that uh, a lot of people did, or not a lot, there was like, I think only five or six of us. Um, I have a friend who worked on a project for Red Hook um, and I know that she is still in contact with them, um, kind of just doing some side stuff for them. Um, as a result, I'm not sure if she's getting paid. I think she just more really felt passionate about the project. Um, but yeah, I do, I do think that a lot of students developed these, you know, specific skills, um, like for Tableau, like programming, other types of things, and felt so passionate about the, the final product that they are continuing to update it, um, at least to work on it. But yeah, so I think, I think that it is a real possibility to be hired based off of the work you did and to continue to work on the work that you did. Um, I just want to address really quickly, uh, Shreya, I, there's a, a question in the chat about um, clarifications about the way forward for schooling. And I just want to say that um, while we completely understand that this is a very important question and really like the thing that is driving all of your lives right now, it's not appropriate to this conversation. So we're not going to discuss it now. Um, and we do, um, we, we do expect or did expect within yesterday or today to have some information from Columbia University and then more details from GSAP. Um, obviously the changes to the F1 and, and other revisions that were just announced are, are throwing a hinge in those plans. So unfortunately, there's no new information that we can provide during this conversation. So let's just try to keep it to the thesis process here. Thank you so much.
Um, so maybe I could also provide a little bit more information on um, something that a lot. Yeah, Jason, just a minute. Uh, Alana um, referred to that uh, she already knew, you know, her client. And so it was pretty natural to get on this um, project. And uh, for some of you who are thinking about Capstone, but don't have quite good idea of who the client may be and, and, and to reach out to so on. Um, in the uh, folder where you find all the thesis and um, capstone guidelines, it's in the UP program information Google folder, right? And uh, in the same folder called uh, UP guidelines and forms, there's a subfolder called potential capstone projects. And there are three files in there and all together there are about a handful of projects that we already got approached by various different agencies. Look at them and most of them have contact info, but you need more um, uh, info, just shoot me an email and we can go from there. Yes, Jason. Um, this may have already been addressed in an email to us because I know the library system has sent some emails, but um, if we need access to materials, it's hypothetically we're not on campus, I know there's a certain policy, most books can't get checked out. Is there a possibility for them to amend that? Because I personally, if I'm, you know, I've done a thesis before and in my undergrad, I had stacks and stacks of books and it's just good to have them on hand. I don't know if there's any talk of that yet, like the contingency. Yes, um, uh, we actually got an email. You, you, I hope you guys got it too yesterday from Avery, the director of Avery Library. And, and so uh, things are moving in somewhat positive, positive direction. Uh, if you didn't get it, I will forward that to you. Uh, basically, all of the digital services are back up, right? It's been not nonstop uh, in any case. You can also say if you need, usually the fair use rule, uh, rule is if you use less than about 10%, they can actually copy a chapter of a book and digitally send it to you, right? But if you need the entire book, one thing is most recent books have digital has ebook versions and you can access directly online through the library. The, the, then the second is the physical books and that will be a little more challenging, but uh, based on the Avery uh, email that, that they are starting. And so if any of you still has book on hold, they have basically extended the deadlines for quite long. And, um, but I don't think you can borrow physical books yet. I don't know when that will start. And then with that, the challenging is uh, we used to be able to order books, say if Columbia doesn't have it and Yale has it, we can do an interlibrary loan and that is not up unless there's sort of digital version of that. So I think it'll gradually open up depending on how much university is opening up. So in that case, you know, Again, um, talk to your advisor. Sometimes we can actually search up Google, version, uh, Google book versions of a book without the entire thing, but with selected parts of it. Uh, or you can sometimes reach out to the author directly. Um, and, and so work with your advisor, I would suggest that, yeah. Okay, so we have a question. So this is about um, outside of the capstone, how much opportunity is there throughout the program to work with organizations outside of or in connection with the university in a more practical as opposed to pure academic capacity? Oh, I see this is probably a question from not a student in this current uh, sort of going to second year actually need to write capstone. Really briefly, um, we have studios um, that both Joy, I think, and Alana mentioned that all of the students in the current rising second year class uh, have been in. Those are all with organizations outside the university and with real, with a real client and a real project. And so, uh, and then we have other courses that do that as well. 
Um, I can chime. Oops, thanks for me. I can chime in here. Uh, I, so I think the question is also asking a little bit about internships. Um, you can definitely pursue part-time internships um, during the academic year. I know a lot of my friends did. I don't know if Alana did, but if she did, she can talk about it too. I did um, in my spring semester, first semester, uh, first year, and then I did like the community planning fellowship, which is kind of like an internship um, throughout the year for my second year. And then during the summer, you're all, I worked with you know, CP. Um, so there's definitely a lot of opportunities to work with outside organizations. And then GSAP also has um, like research assistantships available. Can we can can talk more about that? So let me ask a question to all of you who are in the current um, rising second year class to see if you've had chance to uh, browse through past thesis uh, written by um, um, UP students or now alums uh, over time. Maybe show of hands if you have. Okay, um, I'm not sure I'm seeing hands. And so let me share the screen really quickly here. Um, so if you go up to the UP, um, um, landing page, basically, um, this is the UP, you know, landing page, and you click on thesis and capstones. Um, you scroll down just a little bit, and then we have just over a decade of thesis topics um, archived here. You drop down 2019, any of the titles that have green color, oops, I think I'm sharing the full now, uh, have a direct link. So let's say I click on Eddie's thesis. It takes me directly to Academic Common, which is the open access part of um, Columbia Library. And so uh, you click bottom, you can download the entire thesis PDF, right? Um, obviously, not all students have submitted uh, or were ready to submit to uh, post to Academic Commons because this is a voluntary uh, process. And, and this is actually considered as publication, right? So that's why some students who are hoping to continue to work on it or even publish in some ways or not very happy about their product, choose not to. Um, and I would encourage all of you to kind of look through the previous years and to see you know, what they did, what topics, how they went about it in terms of gathering data and so on. Um, and then we would ask you at the end of your year, right, in 2021, to um, also volunteer for this process. And we don't have 2020 yet uh, because it's, this actually takes a long process for, the, for us to send to the library, which we did then, but for the library to also being able to store it, archive it, and uh, also uh, uh, catalog it. And so uh, that will take at least two to three months. Usually we get the links uh, first thing in September. So check back and if I know more and then I will let you guys know. Um, okay, so about a third of you have seen, uh, have checked out the um, past thesis. So if Alana, if you could share your um, capstone, that'd be super helpful because we don't have any capstone in the last 12 years of uh, topics. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just to speak on this, I did this all the time. I looked at people's old theses and went way back and did a lot of recent ones um, just to give me some sort of grounding or an idea. It was also like a gut check um, to just be like, okay, I'm, you know, like this is, I'm doing the same thing or I'm not doing the same thing. And it was really, really helpful. Um, I can share, I'm going to put the link into the, the chat um, with that has the, the thesis um, and I'm happy to share it with you too. If Thank you. you. Well, Alana is sharing that. I'll read um, Len Ye's question. Um, could you speak to the funding of students' thesis and capstone research? I know students who elected to take some travel studios already received funding and then didn't use that money for travel. For those who didn't, is it still available? If we're not able to travel this for this coming thesis, have you seen creative ways that students have used their funding other than travel? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll answer some and then Alana and Joy chime in, please. So yes. Um, so if you have taken a travel studio, you've kind of used up your travel fund. Um, but if you didn't do a travel studio, then um, yes, you can absolutely um, use um, uh, the next, uh, so probably mid either uh, October, around October, we'll send out a request for students to um, put in applications for how they want to use that travel fund up to a thousand dollars. It's non-competitive. So if you have a good purpose for thesis research or for professional development, like say conference or um, some kind of training um, you can propose. Uh, we do, you know, have a list of students who are in the travel studio. So they are, they can't unfortunately to apply again. Um, but um, we also, um, hopefully, if APA still goes on next spring, have a separate uh, pot of uh, funds to uh, sponsor students to go to the APA conference. So that is not part of this. It's a separate uh, 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 part of the funding. While we're waiting for um, any additional questions to come in, I just wanted to um, do a, a, a quick plug. Um, I'll turn on my camera. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lila, I'm the Director of Programming at GSAP. I just wanted to let you all know that um, Columbia or GSAP is starting a new program um, called Coffee and Conversations with alumni. And this Thursday is the first event. Um, and it's gonna be with uh, Justin Romeo, who uh, works for the city and graduated from UP two years ago. Um, you can find the registration for that on GSAP's Career Services website, which is called Engage. Um, so if you are not uh, familiar with um, the Career Services website, if you go to, I'm for some reason not able to type links into the chat, but um, it's arch.columbia.edu forward slash career dash services. Um, and you can find the Engage Career Services platform there. Um, I don't know if Joy or Alana, if you can like drop it in really quickly. Um, you can, that is where you will find any job listings that GSAP has found that are, would be of interest to students as well as jobs on campus um, or jobs within the department. Um, but it's also where you will find any um, career focused events. And so um, that might be another interesting way to get in touch with a recent alumni to hear about their process and also the projects that they're working on now. Um, I know that that has been um, transmitted mostly to the graduates of uh, the class of 2020, but I think that current students will also be allowed to join that program. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Alana, for typing in that um, uh, that URL. Um, so just my my quick little plug for a conversation that I think will be would be really great for all of you to join if you can. Mm -hmm. um, we also um, had. Um, uh, some students asked before how to try to, uh, you know, if the list I have in there for potential capstone projects isn't quite of interest to you, um, what else you, we can do, you know, to, to, to think about uh, these, you know, capstone projects. 
um, I think you can think back to your studio projects, uh, to think back to some of the, uh, either your uh, instructor or uh, clients or client organizations, or even critiques who mention anything. Um, those are also contacts you can uh, reach out to. You are also welcome to reach out to the um, adjunct faculty. We have a lot, uh, many of them who work in, uh, you know, planning practice. Um, you can reach out uh, to them directly or through me if you like. And so I know RPA, so uh, Alana mentioned about RPA, right? So Regional Plan Association where Tom Wright and the Rachel uh, Weinberger uh, both are there. And Rachel actually did mention, you know, how can we connect with students more? And I kind of suggest to them capstone would be one way uh, because you know RPA uh, has limited resources in terms of hosting internships, but then capstone would be a way of doing uh, you know practical work and not through internship but through you know more of a uh, creative pursuit by a student. I would also like to add that if, um, so I know like going in 2020 and 2021 job opportunities is definitely a big stressor to people. And think even if you're like, even if you're not doing a capstone, even if you're doing a thesis, definitely leverage whatever you do in your thesis as an opportunity to showcase to employers. Um, generally when I am looking for jobs, um, and also as a brief point for looking for jobs, um, start early. Uh, I started in September and, you know, I would get emails, but no solid offer until way until March. But it's good to start doing that interview process so that you're warmed up and familiar so that when jobs do come your way, you're ready. Um, so start early. But when you are going through your thesis process and even if you're not finished and you're in conversations with the prospective employer, have something put together like a short executive summary or like a like a two or three pager um, showcasing what you're doing for your thesis, and you could definitely send it over to the hiring manager as like kind of a work sample just to um, show them not only your technical abilities, but also your writing abilities and your thinking abilities. And it matters a lot. It, it shows that not only you're interested in getting the job, um, that you want the job, but also, you know, you're capable of doing the work that's required. Um, so, you know, I, I you know, even if I didn't do a capstone, my thesis is like more than enough to showcase um, the things that I can bring to the table. Wei Ping, since we don't have more questions emerging in the chat, I think that was a great point, Joy. Um, do you want to, do you have any final thoughts, Wei Ping, before we wrap up? Um, I was just checking with a couple of our faculty who are here to see if they want to say anything. So um, I just send them a private chat. <laughs> sorry, sorry to rush everyone. No, 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 it's totally okay. Um, yeah, um, okay. So um, um, it's still early in the process, and I, it's actually great for many of you already, you know, asking questions to start thinking about thesis and capsule. So in about a month, just before you send in your um, sort of uh, complete your Google form on, on your topics and which advisors you are interested in working with, we'll have another session to really think about, um, you know, whether your topics really are doable or not, you know, sort of Joy mentioned that, you know, don't start thinking about data collection until winter break, right? The winter break is meant for you to actually collect data, if not earlier. So you do, so what topics and what questions you hope to answer to, for many people really depend on, you know, what kind of information you may be able to get, what kind of people you may be able to reach to, and get them agree to talk to you. And so it's an iterative process. So in the next session, I will, I hope to, you know, get you all start thinking about once you have a topic, you know, what would be the next steps to flash out the topic? What would be the next step to flash out what information is needed for that topic? How do you use that thought process to then come back and help you, um, 
you know, maybe revise that topic, maybe make it a little more uh, feasible um, and all of that. So um, for now, free thinking, just kind of go on there and like Joyce was saying, you know, read newspaper, read books, keep in touch with what's going on out there. There are lots of pressing issues and what they might, which ones may be of interest to you and then jot them down and, um, you know, kind of go, um, can accumulate your thoughts and ideas as they, uh, you know, you have more than a, a month to go through that. So there's really no rush. And usually um, you will still take a few more weeks in the fall semester for you to finalize on, um, on um, you know, on a topic. Um, Okay, so unless um, any, anyone else, you know, uh, one of our faculty wants to say something, uh, we'll probably just end here. It's, it's about time anyway, because um, um, Lila has to host another event at uh, 12.30. So everyone, uh, you know, take care. I hope to see you again uh, soon. And uh, in the meantime, feel free to reach out. Um, best of luck, you know, Joy and Alana. Now you are uh, um, out there uh, in the real practice and we really appreciate you being here and uh, hope to see you too uh, at some point. Thank you everyone and bye.